the initial idea of The Sopranos is, what if a mob boss went to therapy? We open with Tony Soprano meeting Dr. Melfi for the first time. Melfi. What part of the boot you from, hun? Dr. Melfi. And David Chase's show sets up a simple question. Can Tony be cured? With Dr. Melfi, this outsider with a special window into Tony's psyche, we then spend six seasons trying to figure out if this patient can be helped. Let's talk about that. What? Rage. Why? Depression is rage turned inward. Ten years after The Sopranos ended and nearly 20 after its premiere, Tony remains one of the most iconic TV characters ever. He ushered in the age of the anti-hero in a show that's given credit for ushering in the golden era of TV. We don't want to be Tony, but we can't stop watching him. The show hooks us with a back and forth between humanizing him and making us feel for him, and then reminding us again that his violence is inexcusable and he might be a textbook sociopath. You're not a truthful person. You're not respectful of women. You're not really respectful of people. I don't love people. Maybe you love them, I don't know. You take what you want from them by force, or the threat of force. We want to know if he can reconcile his two faces and his two families, and if digging deeper into root causes from childhood really leads to anything. The psychiatry shit. Apparently what you're feeling is not what you're feeling, and what you're not feeling is your real agenda. So is there hope for someone like Tony Soprano, or is there such a thing as a lost cause? Do you feel like Frankenstein? A thing? Lacking humanity? Lacking human feelings? Before we go on, be sure to hit subscribe and click the bell to get notifications on all of our new videos. Tony and his crew idolize the version of the mob that they see in classic films like The Godfather and Goodfellas. I've been going a long time. Let me hear it. Just when they thought I was out? They pull me back in. <laughs> These films are grand, sweeping epics where even murder and betrayal look beautiful. Tony's New Jersey life looks common and ugly in comparison. When the crew tries to watch The Godfather 2, the disc doesn't work. Oh! So this symbolizes the disconnect between their mob nostalgia and their reality. You know what scene I love most? It was you, Fredo. Polly refers to Fredo Corleone betraying his brother in The Godfather 2. I know it was you, Fredo. Not knowing that Big Pussy is working for the FBI at that point. And the scene where Tony's shot at holding a bottle of orange juice echoes the scene in The Godfather when Don Corleone is shot buying oranges. So The Sopranos gives us self-aware nods to these iconic films, but the show intentionally de-glamorizes them. They made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And the point is not just that the glory days are long gone, it's that they never existed to begin with. They were just a fiction given to us by some very beautiful movies. You know the heyday, you know the golden age, or whatever of the mob? That's gone, and that's never coming back. The show also undermines our expectations of who a mafia boss is. What do we mean when we say leadership? Hmm? Tony Soprano is no Michael Corleone. He's more of a George Costanza. I was in the pool! Often seen in his bathrobe, unable to escape the senseless irritations and maddening minutia of suburban boredom. Oh, come on, I'm a fat crook from New Jersey. Tony doesn't even meet his own criteria of an aspirational male hero. Whatever happened to Gary Cooper? The strong, silent type. He's sensitive, temperamental, and prone to tantrums. He feels emotionally weak. I got the will by the balls and I can't stop feeling like I'm a f***ing loser. And his crew members are inept. Christopher is a wild card. I got home too late last night. I didn't want to wake the man up. Did you get up early this morning and call? He's always in his office by six. I was nauseous this morning. My mother told me I shouldn't even come in today. He doubts that his son, AJ, has what it takes. My business, forget it. He'd never make it. And Polly and Silvio can be bumbling and reckless. I can feel it itching me already. Tony's life may lack the glamour of the Corleones, but his arc does echo Michael's in The Godfather Part Two. You got no f idea what it's like to be number one. Every decision you make affects every facet of every other f thing. It's too much to deal with almost. And in the end, you're completely alone with it all. Michael claims all along that he's doing everything for his family. Don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again. Ever. 
Yet he ends up alone, having killed or driven away all of the members of his family. And over time, Tony also shocks us by killing off ever closer members of both his mob family and his extended blood family. In season two, he's physically sick before he kills Big Pussy. Killing his best friend turned informant on a boat suggests that Tony is emotionally at sea. It also recalls the setting of Fredo's murder. Tony goes on to order Adriana's death, shoot his cousin, Tony Blundetto, and even kill Christopher, who's been arguably closer than a son to him. Like Michael, Tony justifies his line of work with the idea that he's doing it all for his family. Everything this family has comes from the work I do. All right, Tony, that's enough. But as much as he does love Carmela and the kids, he rarely puts their emotional needs first. <laughs> and obviously he puts them at risk with his business. Godfather 2 ends with the melancholy image of Michael in tragic isolation, having sacrificed his family for his successful business. And Tony, likewise, moves more and more toward this cold emptiness. He shows no remorse for killing Christopher. When he dreams about confessing his crimes to Dr. Melfi, at first he performs fake grief. This is pain like I'm not used to. But then he tells her how he really feels. The biggest blunder of my career is now gone. Michael Corleone's pain is filtered through cinematic beauty. But with Tony, an ugly emotional truth is presented in mundane, unflattering images that refuse to give us the nostalgia, glamour, or romance we expected from mob stories before The Sopranos. The central paradox of Tony Soprano is that this big, bad mafia boss has a sensitive psyche. Like King Midas in reverse here, everything I touch turns to shit. I'm not a husband to my wife. I'm not a father to my kids. I'm not a friend to my friends. I'm nothing. In his profession, Tony is expected to bury his feelings or to have no feelings at all. And he's embarrassed about seeing a therapist, taking medication, and having panic attacks. But for the viewer, Tony's mental health struggles humanize him. We realize he's grappling with deep feelings he can't always explain. And he's plagued by self-loathing. Wish there was me in there. Giving the beating or taking it. Tony resents happy-go-lucky people who don't bear his psychic burden. I see some guy walking down the street, you know, with a, with a clear head. You know that type. He's always whistling, like the happy wanderer. And I just want to go up to him and I just want to rip his throat open. I want to grab him and pummel him right there for no reason. And his complicated dreams show us an active subconscious, a side of him that even he can't access most of the time. <laughs> Crucially, Tony's family history, to some extent, explains away his violence in our eyes. Tony's mother, Livia, is a devious, nihilistic person. I say what your mother has, at the very least, is what we call borderline personality disorder. She's almost like the devil on Tony's shoulder, pressing him to give in to his unhappiness and dissatisfaction. Oh, poor you! She manipulates Tony's uncle Junior into ordering a hit on her own son. I'm trying to do the right thing by you. You're trying to be what? She doesn't understand you. She's smiling. Look at the look on her face. After seeing just how dysfunctional this relationship is, we want to give Tony a pass sometimes. What kind of person can I be where his own mother wants him dead? And then there's the history of mental illness in Tony's family line. I remember hearing about my great, great, great grandfather. He drove a mule cutter for Mountain Road. Probably was a panic attack. This is pretty much confirmed when AJ starts having panic attacks, just like Tony and Tony's father before him. Tony's guilt about passing on these genes represents a deeper self-hatred. He's afraid that his children will inherit the worst parts of himself. When you blame your genes, you're really blaming yourself. We don't see AJ and Meadow become killers, but we do see them both suffer from depression and hopelessness. My rotten putrid genes have infected my kid's soul. That's my gift to my son. So with all of this throughout the show, we make a lot of excuses for Tony. If he can't fully change for the better, well, maybe he's just inherited too heavy of a burden and he can't get himself out from under it. The first time we get to see Tony for the unapologetic killer that he is, is in the season one episode, College. Tony takes Meadow to visit colleges and happens to recognize a former mafia soldier turned informant who since joined the Witness Protection Program. We're kind of shocked when Tony kills the guy because we've been watching him play the doting father for most of the episode. So the shift from good dad to cold-blooded killer is jarring. Are you in the mafia? In the what? David Chase actually had to convince the HBO executives that this plot point was necessary. Chris Albrecht didn't want, said, he said, you know, you, you've, you've, you have four episodes there, you've, you've created one of the most compelling 
protagonists in American television and you're going to be flushing him down the toilet by having him kill that guy. So this episode caused a sea change in TV. We're used to seeing stuff like this all the time now, but in that moment, The Sopranos made murderous antiheroes fair game. We have to wonder if we'd ever have gotten Breaking Bad without this episode of The Sopranos. A guy opens his door and gets shot and you think that of me? No, I am the one who knocks. As the show goes on, Tony's ruthlessness and his love for his family duke it out. In the end, your friends are gonna let you down. Family, they're the only ones you can depend on. Early on, we get fewer killings with more time between them. So we have the space to wonder if he's feeling doubt or regret. But it becomes increasingly clear that violence isn't the exception for Tony, it's the rule. And by the end, ruthless Tony is the one who wins that battle for his soul. The show started with that question of whether therapy would do anything for Tony. And we get a clear answer. It's no. Apparently, the talking cure actually helps them become better criminals. In season six, Melfi realizes that if anything, her therapy sessions are enabling Tony. She's allowing him to perform the right moral emotions so that he can go on behaving exactly the same without having to worry about any guilt. Yoshelson says they sharpen their skills as con men on their therapists. Crocodile tears, what have you. Melfi's conclusion makes us think back to all of the times Tony tried to manipulate or seduce her and then stormed out. But we also can't forget how he opened his mind and his past to her. How it's way out. You know what they call it? I think whoever said that didn't understand depression. But you do. And at least at times, he really did want to heal. So if Melfi's had it with him, where does that leave us? Tony does have breakthroughs and he develops deeper self-knowledge. But in the end, not much comes of it. What is f***ing self-knowledge? What the f*** has it gotten me? The abrupt cut to black in the series finale denies us the moment we've been waiting for, for Tony. The peace, the realization, the catharsis, the pulling it all together. But instead of becoming a new, better person, Tony is just the deeply confused, contradictory patient we met in season one. Only now, he has the vocabulary to describe what's wrong with him. Obviously, I'm prone to depression. A certain bleak attitude about the world. Thanks for watching, and if you like our videos, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just click this link here. We spend a lot of time making these videos, and every little bit helps. And of course, the very best thing you can do is subscribe to our channel to get access to all of our latest videos.